Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. How you guys doing? It's good to see everybody. Um, we are just like right on time here, so we're going to let it give a couple of minutes for people to come in and uh, do our thing. Hope everybody's doing well. It's a weird world we're living in. We know. We already know all that. Everybody getting along okay, yeah? John, did you get your book, buddy? I did. Super. Awesome. Right. Awesome. As excellent. Good. Well, we're going to do a little review. We're going to do the second part of that oil printing today. I got a little different method now. You saw the last time we were on here. I'm using my GoPro and uh, setting that up, shooting it, and then coming back around. So, um, you know what? I'm probably not going to wait too, too much longer here. We'll see what happens. I just went over there and uh, kind of advertised that we're doing this, but um, who knows? People might be preoccupied today. So, oh, no, we don't want to cancel that. Cancel. All right. So I hope I don't have to let anybody in here. I think everything will be okay. I'm going to go ahead and do this. Um, we are going to start this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a video of the oil printing process and talk you guys through the second part, which will be cool because uh, I don't have to run around like a chicken with my head cut off. Can everybody see that, I hope? And our full screen. Yeah. You can mute that. So this is the second part. And here we're, <clears throat> so the first part, what we did is we made the gelatin, 8% gelatin. We let it swell, we heated it up, liquefied it, poured the alcohol in it. And I went ahead and poured the paper with it. So um, this is the paper that we were messing with. So I did Yepo here. This is a sheet of Yepo, all dried down. And I also show um, the Hannah Mule paper in there as well too. So some people like to blue tape these down. I like to pin them. Um, you can go through a lot of blue tape if you, uh, use blue tape, which is fine. If you want to tape it down, you can. Um, and it depends on the paper and the tape and stuff. Like I said before, I use two pipettes, an acetone and a dichromate pipette. They're about, they're th not about, they're three mils each. Plain, plain good old acetone and a 10% potassium dichromate uh, mixture. So 10% is going to be diluted down to about 5%. So I'm going to take three mils of dichromate here or thereabouts. Um, I'd say between, you know, 0. 0.65 and 0. 0.75 milliliters, uh, you know, 60, 0. 0. 0.60 milliliters. Um, this is happens to be six by six inches, 36 square inches. So I'm going to use about, um, actually 0. 0.095. I'm going to use about seven, six and a half or seven mils of complete solution. So three mils of potassium dichromate and three mils of acetone. Mix it together, a little more there, just to, some of the old literature talks about um, two parts acetone, one part dichromate, but I found this worked quite well. You'll see here in just a bit. So I'm gonna pour all this out in the center of the, the uh, dried Yepo, this happens to be Yepo, the dried gelatin, nice and flat again, pour it out, don't let it puddle too much and start moving it around. Just take your brush and start moving that, or that, that solution around. Let it soak in. Now, if you didn't wet your brush, which I didn't in this case, um, you're gonna have to squeeze your brush out a little bit. You'll see me do that here a couple of times. But just move that around. It'll start to soften the gelatin. Obviously, there's water, there's acetone in it, right? And water in the dichromate. Um, get it nicely covered. Now, you know, I was reading the other day and wet dichromates obviously are not light sensitive. I'm under a big 5,600 Kelvin temperature light here filming this. But when they dry, they become, see, see me squeezing the brush out there? That's what I'm talking about. I, I squeeze that dichromate out of the brush. When they become dry, the old literature says they're three to four times as sensitive as a silver chloride print. So you might want to watch that. You might want to uh, take caution on that. So 
Some of the old literature says to brush quickly and effectively. Uh, don't, don't go over it and over it like I'm doing here. But I found that this works just fine. I let it soak into the gelatin. I'm almost finished here. Uh, once it starts to dry up and you've used all of that dichromate up out of your brush, I squoze it again there. My brush is dry. Um, I'm good to go. So this is the Yepo paper. This is that plastic paper. You're going to see this in this video. You're going to see how this releases the gelatin so much faster, or the dichromate so much faster out of the gelatin than the paper. It's just, it's amazing. So there, there I'm about finished up there. I'm going to stop right here, I think. That'll do it. I'm really, that, that uh, plastic and the gelatin was super, super dry. So that's why I work this in so much. But normally you don't have to work it this much, but I did have a super dry um, environment here in Colorado. So there it is. The Yepo flattens out quite well, uh, doesn't curl quite as much. So now I'm just gonna go hang this and dry it, uh, let it dry. So there it is. So not sensitive while it's wet, but definitely sensitive while it's dry. Here's the Hannah Mule paper. This is a little more crinkly, and, and watch how this absorbs the um, dichromates. So I did two prints here. I did one on Yepo and one on the Hannah Mule, and we're going to see the difference in them here, not only in sensitizing, but when we do the final, the next video, when we actually do the rolling out. So same process here. Uh, three mils of 10% potassium dichromate and three mils of acetone. Basically, it gives you a 5% dichromate to put on the gelatin. So there's my three mils of um, dichromate. And three mils of acetone. And again, I use separate pipettes and just I'll use them over and over again. So I don't cross contaminate. I don't have any issues with that at all. See that acetone spin up in that uh, dichromate really interact with it and bubble up. Again, I pour the entire, um, see I soaked a lot of that up in my brush there, and that's okay because I can work it out of my brush too. In fact, you don't get the puddling. The, the Hannah Meal paper will now start to flatten out once it gets wet, both the acetone and the water and the dichromate. It'll flatten out. See, I'm squeezing that out of the brush squeeze and, and squeeze and uh, and push around vertically and horizontally really simple to do anybody can do this it's not a this is not the trick of the oil print this is uh, this is something entirely different than anybody can do but I want to caution you dichromates are very dangerous they're hazardous to your health uh, especially in the dry form but you do want to wear gloves while you're doing this. You don't want to inhale them or get them, you know, you don't want to be soaking in them like the old dishwater, dishwasher detergent metal commercial. You're soaking in it. You do not want to soak in dichromates. Uh, carcinogenic, they have some other problems with them too. So there's the Hannah Mule paper, absorbed up a lot faster than the uh, Yepo or the plastic paper. There it is. So I'm gonna go hang this up and we're gonna move on to the next, uh, about 30 minutes later, I uh, pull these down and we're gonna load them up in the contact printer. So there it is. Boom, boom, boom. You guys can do this, it's really easy. So here we are at the contact printer. I'm gonna do my traditional tree shot here again, just so you can see how that's rolled out and made. Grab my paper. I'm going, to put, uh, I'm going to put this one on the Hannah Mule. And notice my break in my contact printer. Um, emulsion side to emulsion side. Square that up. Notice my break there. So you want to look at the top. Depending on where you want to look, you want to adjust that so you can break that contact printer away and look at the, the print. So if you make sure you have the correct exposure. So there's the tree shot or the no trespassing from my ghost dance project there. I'm gonna put that in. That's on the Hannah Mule paper. And you'll see me roll this out the next, the next uh, time we meet up here. Hook up your uh, contact printer. 
There's your first one, ready to go. I cleaned all my glass off before, make sure you don't have any smudges or marks. Set that one aside and let's grab the Yepo paper and load up the rabbit skull and the gallnut shot. And these are great, these contact printers are, I just love them, I have a handful of them and I just, anytime I can get them, I'll get them. You can never have too many contact printers. I'm trying to figure out which way I wanna go here. So I wanna put the rabbit skull up top, emulsion to emulsion. Just checking which emulsion side. Yep, there you go, Quinn. Line that up and fit it in your contact printer. Important to have your paper fit for your contact printer as well. Um, so you don't have any problems getting your glass or your frame over the contact printer. And wait until you see the relief on this. You're gonna see this here in just a few minutes after we come back after the exposure here. We're gonna show you the exposure. I did 11 minutes on the tree and I actually pulled the rabbit skull, this image here, I pulled this at nine minutes. So there's my Ryonet screen printer. Both of the images are up here. I'm gonna go for a total of 11 minutes on the tree and I'm gonna pull the skull, this one, at nine minutes. It's, a, it's not a full lit, it's a still life using north light inside, so I shaved off a couple of minutes. There's my Ryonet screen printer. Rabbit skull and gall nuts, oak galls. And the no trespassing, going in, let's do this. I just have a little piece of styrofoam to protect the backs from the lid slamming down on them. There we go, start the 11 minutes, off and running. 350 nanometers, there we go. So nine and 11 minutes later, this is 11 minutes. I'm gonna show you what you're gonna look for. See that brown staining? We're gonna check the exposure on this. So if I pull this back and look at it, I, I can actually see detail in the tree trunk there in the, in, the shot, in the highlights of the tree trunk and also on the sign. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this. I'll show you the entire print here. Oh, there you go. I see the details in the foreground and even in the no trespassing sign. And then here's the rabbit skull and gall nuts. Oh, galls, there you go. Plenty of detail in that skull, plenty of detail. So nine minutes was perfect on that. I can see, and the, and the gall, oak galls, I can see detail in, so both of them. So we're gonna wash these prints now. 65 center degree water, you know, 18 to 21 Celsius, somewhere in there. Not too hot, um, it's better to be cold than, than too hot. 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius is really nice, um, depending on how fast you wanna do them. I use my little garden stones, my little rocks to hold these down. I did them in two tubs, I'll separate them out here in just a second. You should do them separately, but I just to, just to show you both of them, I went ahead and dropped them both in the same pan. <clears throat> just hold the rock, the rock's just in the safe, safe zone of the print where there's no image, the rocks just hold that down. So I'm just gonna wash over a couple of tubs of, of uh, again, the cool water, same temperature, tepid water, 70 degrees, so more or less. I'm just gonna start washing that over. I'm really a stickler on temperature and time these prints are in, in the wash. wash. Watch how quickly the Yepo paper clears. You can already see the dichromate in the water coming up. The water is yellow now. So I'm gonna pull that up to 68, 70 degrees, 20 degrees, 21 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. Just gonna keep washing that over. It's kind, of, it's kind of like switching a bath out, you know, that kind of thing. And we're still at that same temperature, 65, 68 degrees, anywhere in there. And really you wanna do this for about a half an hour. Um, I, go from, uh, I go from, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on the, the image and, and what I'm doing. But you'll see me cut away. I have about 10 minutes that I didn't show here. You'll see me cut away here and put these in separate uh, pans. But boy, this Yepo clears really fast. Yepo is great if you, if you don't mind the material. 
Um, I tend to like the uh, watercolor papers a little better. I'll show you some of these in just a second here. Look at how clear that Yepo is already. It's already clearing out. <clears throat> Patience is the name of the game here. You don't want to go too long because then you're gonna you're gonna overswell your prints and get that uh, waterlogged gelatin, and you don't want to go too warm. 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 23 degrees Celsius would be maximum you'd want on these. Look at the Yepo on the right and the and the Hannah Meal on the left. That paper tends to hold the dichromate a lot more. I have I turn the pan around because the rushing water. There's uh, some spots you can you'll you'll be able to see these the dichromates coming out unevenly. I haven't even added the EDTA yet. You'll see that here in just a second. <clears throat> there we go. So patience and clearing, man, that, that Yepo print is almost cleared, all except for where the gallnuts are there. And the, the sky and the, you know, look at, look at the highlights clearing before the, the shadows, right? I mean, that's, that's obvious. So there's the sky and the tree shot that's clearing. I'm blowing the water off to see if there's any relief there. And then I'm going to pull up this Yepo print. You can already see five minutes in. If you look close here, you're going to see the rabbit skull on this Yepo print is already swollen. I blew it off. There it is. You can see, look at that. You can see that. See that rabbit skull? It's already swollen. The highlights have already swollen. So I'm going to separate the pans now. And I'm going to go to my EDTA. I use a very, very weak solution of this clearing agent just to clear the print completely or close to completely. Now, people are going to say, hey, Quinn, that print isn't, those prints aren't completely free of dichromate. Well, keep in mind, the next time we meet, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to swell them for 30 minutes. So I still have another 30 minutes in the water. So not a big deal. Um, you'll see how clear I get them. They're, they're clear enough. They work just fine. Again, getting that temperature, I try to use uh, my touch as much as I can to gauge, but I'll, I'll also always use the uh, um, thermometer just to make sure. The first one, fill that up. I look, fill them about half full. And now I'm gonna uh, mix up some EDTA, some clearing agent that I can pour in these and really get them really get them cleared. About a 0.5% solution, not much at all. A couple of teaspoons in a liter usually does it. Two teaspoons, mix it up with that. Look at that Yepo print on the top, how clear that is versus the one down below. I use semi-warm water. Um, again, 75 degrees or so, it, it, uh, it dissolves that EDTA pretty quickly. All tap water, dissolve that in. And I'm gonna pour half of it in the first tub, in the first tray, and half of it in the Yepo tray. And then I'll just go ahead and top. It's kind of slimy, it put, the EDTA makes kind of a slimy uh, surface, so I just rinse that out. There we go. Now I'm just gonna let them sit for a bit and uh, let them clear the rest of the way. <clears throat> so the next portion of this, you're gonna see the relief. So this was probably a total of 30, 35 minutes of being in water, 15 minutes to clear that initial dichromate out of the print, and then another 15 or 20 minutes with the EDTA in it. Um, I don't know, I think I probably cut away 10, or, 10, or, 10 minutes or so between these two, but that's it. Okay, here we are. Let's take a look at the relief. I'm going to do the Yepo print first, and you'll see the relief just in 30 minutes, uh, swelling that. This is where you can gauge if your exposure was good or not, too. I'm just tapping the extra water off. You can see the relief in the skull already. But once, man, you get, I get the angle of that light on there just right, and you can really see it. I'm looking at it myself here. I'm, there you go. There's some relief. That skull, remember? The highlights do not harden, so they swell. 
the shadows harden and they, they remain flat. So that's why you get that, that relief in the print. I'm just checking out all the details, looking at it. So there you go, look at that. The galls, the oak galls are really, really pronounced out there. Now, this is the Hanamiel paper, so the relief isn't quite as deep, but you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. There's the shot. You can still see the tree trunk. You can still see that everything's kind of popping out there. We could roll these out right now, but uh, we're gonna do this next time. So there's, there's a nice relief there. The tree, the dark trees are flat and the sky behind them is swollen. You just get a little more uh, extreme relief with that. See that still life shot. So there they are, that's it. So that's the second part. You've, you've dichromated your paper with a dry gelatin on it. You've let that dry, you put the a negative on it, you've exposed it, in this case, nine and 11 minutes. Uh, the still life was nine, 11 minutes for the uh, outdoor shot. And then I cleared them. Hey, welcome, welcome. Good to see you, Phil. Um, I hope there's not anyone in here. Let's go to the gallery view and see. Yeah. Um, so that's the that's the basis of it. So at this point, in the first video, you saw me mix the gelatin, 500 mils of cold distilled water, sprinkle that in, shake it up, let it swell, heat it up, liquefy it, pour the alcohol in to clear the bubbles. And then I went ahead and just poured the paper. I marked the paper, used our magnetic strips, poured the paper with the gelatin, let that dry for a day. Now we came back in this video today and we took the dry gelatin paper and we put the 5% dichromate. It's 10% concentrate with an additional three mils of acetone in it, so it cuts it down to 5%. 5% dichromate on it, let it dry for 15 or 20 minutes, brought it out, laid our negatives down, emulsion to emulsion on our contact printers, made our exposure in the Rionet or the screen printer. You can do this in the sun as well too. You just have to check more often. I know my negatives so I can set these and go. There's not a problem, I, I, I know pretty much where I'm gonna get a good negative. So after I make the negative, or the exposure, pull the negative, put them in the pan. I do an initial wash of just tepid water, like you saw in the video there. I just do an initial wash to get a lot of that dichromate out. Flush that out, fill the pans back up, make my little EDTA. In this case, the small prints, I only used a half a liter each on them, about 0.5 EDT. EDT, EDTA solution, that's easy for me to say, um, of a clearing agent that just helps pull that uh, uh, dichromate out. Uh, dichromates are chrome based, chromium based, and that EDTA actually has, uh, uh, it's, it's a compound that attracts that, so it helps pull it out. Sulfuric acid, sodium sulfite, sol sodium sulfide, are all great uh, compounds to use in clearing. And if you don't have any of those, use water. Just wash it a little longer, right? Um, so now at this point, let me see, where are they here? At this point, we have in our possession, uh -huh, let me see if I can get them out. In our possession here, the dried, what you just saw there, let me see here if I can pull this up. The dried uh, tree shot, right? Nice and flat. There's nothing, nothing raised in that. So in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to swell these in that in water again to to swell the gelatin. Then we're going to take them over and we're going to roll them out and make the final image. So these three parts will walk you through each of these uh, scenarios. There's the uh, there's the skull shot, the rabbits and the 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 gall. This is this Yepo paper is cool. This stuff is is cool. It's a little more bendy. Hanamiel Yepo, shiny, uh, more flat here. Sorry, more flat here. Shiny here, more more flat here. They'll both be beautiful prints as we roll them out. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about is I just I'm trying some new paper. I told you, or I said to somebody, I don't know who I said it to. 
Um, but I'm gonna do a print series of, of this ghost dance work on, I'm gonna do a series of these um, uh, six by six oil prints. And I just got a load of this in. This is the Arches hot press uh, paper, really good stuff. Um, I already poured, um, this is a little crinkly, but there's a whole plate, the Ar I just call it Arches hot press. And I'm gonna also try, uh, try some on the uh, uh, six by six negatives. Really nice paper, I'm excited to, to try it. It's just, uh, it's 300, it's 140 pounds, uh, 300 gram square meter, right? Pretty decent paper, not extremely heavy, not as heavy as the Arches Platino, Platine, Platine paper. And obviously the Yepo is a plastic paper. So experiment with the papers. You're gonna find, um, and of course the, the good old Hannah Mule paper, that's, that's always a winner. Um, you're gonna find your flavor of paper makes a big difference in the final image. Um, the detail, the, um, um, uh, the reflectivity, the um, sheen, if you will, how glossy or matte it is. Um, obviously the type of ink you use and the style that you roll it out or pounce it out with is going to make a big difference. But just a heads up, I got three of these packs. I think uh, I got, uh, yeah, I got three of these. So I got what, 36, 30, 36 sheets of 23 by 31 centimeters, basically nine by 12 big sheets. Uh, decent sheets for what I work in um, for 40 bucks, 40 US dollars, something like that. Um, great deal for me. I mean, I, I love them. They, they, uh, I'm excited to use that. I, I guess I shouldn't give a, an endorsement until I actually have prints from them, huh? But <laughs> I, th I think from what I see right now and, and how they have performed as, as far as the uh, initial pouring and and uh, gelatinizing the plates, I think that it looks great. So, so that's where we're at. We've got, a, we've got an oil print, uh, we've got the matrix ready to go to swell and to ink up. And this last part, uh, the part we'll do on Wednesday, um, this last part is the most critical. I mean, it's all critical, right? I mean, you have to get, you have to nail it along the way. But this last part is, is how the image looks. So it's gonna be, your style, how you how you work that ink onto the print. So we're going to use the gra lithographic ink. We're going to use 1803, the dark brown. That's I don't the black is okay. It, it depends on the image, right? It just depends on on what kind of image you're doing. Um, the black tends to be a lot higher contrast, uh, and, and you know depends on your exposure and your negative and your relief and all that. But I like the subtlety. It takes probably a little longer with the 1803 dark brown to get that, that contrast. But at the end of the day, it gives you, I think gives you a better range and it gives you uh, uh, that color, that color that I'm after, that warm, uh, beautiful kind of memory based color. That's what I go for. And I think I said this last time, the reason I select that color is it's a lot like uh, the warm uh, coffee cream, uh, warm colors in the positive process of the wet collodion process. And uh, I, you know, I'm a real big fan of that, the, the memory word, um, bringing you back, taking you back visually somewhere. And that's a big part of my work. So um, it's really important for me to have the right color, but yet still have the, um, have the um, um, image, you know, have a good solid con. I like contrast. I like, I like, I don't like flat images. I like contrasty images, even if they're pictorialist and soft. Let me grab that. Let me grab that tree shot one time here. Let me grab this real quick. I should have had this over here, but I wasn't thinking. Just as an example of uh, kind of the difference, I was just thinking I, I ran the melted gelatin. Um, this is uh, 1803 dark brown. I'm in a little spot there. This is the 1803 dark brown on a tree shot. You see that? And that's on, that's on arches paper. That's on arches. And now look at this. This is black. This is the 1793 lithograph black. 
and you can see that's my melted uh, skull shot, right? That's act, we're doing that one right now in this. So you can kind of, can you see the difference in the color? Little, little richer here, right? I think, I don't know. I guess if you could see them in person, but a um, little richer in color. And again, I, I'm sure I pounced this around with a brush. I'm sure I went in there and took some ink and pounced that down, right? Just for contrast. I'm sure I did that. I can't say for absolute sure, but I'm sure I did because I like I like kind of the vignetting. The I like the how close can we get? I don't know. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but I like the um, I like the vignetting, right? And so. Again, your own personal style. These are just ideas. You may work a completely different way than I do um, to get to a, to get the visual that you want. Right? I'm just uh, I'm just giving you some ideas of how I work and what I'm trying to accomplish with my negatives and understanding my negatives, understanding what kind of exposure I need on them, what kind of percentage of gelatin, and what methodologies I use to get there. That's really that's what it is at the end of the day, right? It's it's how we get to the point we we have this vision in our head that we want these images to look a certain way. So how technically do how how do we accomplish that technically is what I'm saying. So it's all up to you. You you're in the driver's seat. There's no real right or wrong way to do this. These are just ideas like and you can learn from everybody. I always say that you can always learn from people um, that have been doing it. And uh, you're gonna see in this next segment, in this next video that we do, actually rolling the ink out and pouncing out and adding, adding color, taking color away, adding ink, taking ink away, um, and getting the image to where uh, you want it and how you want it to look kind of thing. So that's where we're at. Um, and I accomplished that in 33 minutes. That's a lot better than walking around with my laptop trying to go in the dark room and, and do all this stuff, right? I mean, I hope I hope that works a little better for you guys. I think it does. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, okay, thanks, John. Um, I think it works better. That is a good looking background you got there, Jan. That looks like Norway to me. All right, you lost your hand when you did that, but that's okay. <laughs> it's uh thousand meter up from sea level how many thousand meter a thousand meters okay do you believe right up yeah right at the top a thousand meters that's pretty good do you believe that i in one hour's drive from where i'm sitting right now i can be at five thousand meters yeah so we live i live right now i live at 1800 meters so i'm quite high the air is very thin here I think John said the other day, um, talking about the exposure difference of taking all, all I'm closer to the sun, right? And, and all that pollution. You imagine now my exposures are probably really, really uh, are short now because there's the, all the factories and all the production are kind of shut down and everything. I can only imagine. That's a, uh, I read the other day in India, for the first time in 30 years, they can see the Himalaya mountains. Kind of interesting stuff. Yeah, kind of crazy. We are living in a very unique, crazy world. That's for sure. So, Wait, have you tried have you tried matting the UPO yet? I was wondering how well you get it flattened out. Um, how do I get it flattened out? That's a great question. Um, I have a heat press. I don't know if you saw that over there by my Rayonet, but I have a big. Uh, 20 by 24 um, Bogan heat press, right? The, the good old type that you can use with silver chloride and silver gelatin prints. Obviously, you can't heat gelatin; it melts. Remember, um, that's how that's how that's how I accomplish this. <laughs> it melts gelatin. What I do is I put the uh, I, I I use weight. I just flatten it with weight, and I put it put them in my press, and I close the press down and tighten it and I get them relatively flat. Now, the other way to accomplish that, and the bet, really the best way to accomplish that is to put, put them in the frame and clamp them and stretch them out, put them in a frame and let them dry, bone dry. And, and if you're doing big prints, um, like the one I showed you the other day, I was looking over here if I have a print out or not, I guess I don't. Um, the, anything over eight by 10, you're gonna have to clamp because 
that stuff will get to the point where you can't, and you can't heat it up to flatten it out. That's the problem with these, right? You can dampen them and put them in a press. That's, that's, there's a couple of different methods to do that. I just do mine dry and they tend to flatten out. I mean, you saw those, they're, they're pretty flat um, for, I got them stuffed under there again. They're pretty flat though for just coming out of the wash. And when I hang them, I have weights. I clamp weights on the, I clip weights on the bottom. And these are small, even whole plate. They're eight by 10 sheets of paper. You can manage that. I think anything over that, you get too much curling on them. So either a press or a bunch of heavy, hey, great use for the old Encyclopedia Britannica's, right? <laughs> eight by 10 or smaller, you can just stack that weight up and that, that'll flatten them out in a day or two. But make sure you do that if you ink them up and they're the final print and they're, they're curly and wavy, make sure that that ink is dry because yeah, you, you'll have a mess if you don't. You'll have a transfer print, right? Onto your book or your weight or whatever. So that's how I do mine anyway. These, these mount up, I mean, you can see, they're, it's not perfect, but they, they mount up okay. They're not perfect by any, but they're oil prints, right? I mean, so. They're not, they're not to flattened albumin or salt or clodio chloride's beautiful. Um, oh, I saw this the other day. Look at this. I still have this in my book. I got to show you guys this. Where is it? Where did you run off to there? Um, geez, I can't find it now. Oh, it's all the way at the bottom. Of course it is, Quinn. Let me show you this. I was thumbing through my book. I was online with somebody. And I brought my book up and I said, hey, um, let's turn to this page. And so I was thumbing through my book. You, gotta, you guys got to see this. I was thumbing through my book and I came to this. This is the print that we're doing. It's a collodial chloride print from about three weeks ago that hasn't been washed or fixed. Still in my book. Obviously, didn't get any light. But I mean, talk about, you know, that's a collodio chloride print. And that's on, oh, that's on Yepo. That's on Yepo as well. But wow, talk durable. Man, collodio chloride. Talk about archival, huh? Good God, not even washed. You wouldn't have a print. I don't care if you kept it from white. You wouldn't have a print nowadays that would do that. I'm going to stack all these back over here. So anybody have anything? We want to chat about anything? Uh Please. Uh, Quinn. Please. John. Uh, John. Yes, John. Uh, two days ago, I tried uh, gelatin uh, chloride prints. And uh, I see your video. I've not got your book yet. I'm waiting for four weeks now. <laughs> ah, man, thanks, coronavirus. <laughs> yes. But I go look at your video, and uh, there was 24, uh, 25 grams of uh, gelatin and 100 milliliter of uh, water. Yes. When I mix, when I mix that uh, four milliliter, yes. water, uh, gelatin, hot gelatin, and uh, two milliliter uh, silver, I think this uh, solution, uh, Allah, this uh, was a little too thick. Okay, or, have... or the second part, Jan, maybe it's too cold, too cold. Yes, a co cold around me. Yes, I, I think that's yeah. probably the problem. And that's, I've heard this before. And what I recommend, and it, if, it, if, if it is in fact too, too thick or too gelatinous, and it's not the temperature, you know, gelatin start, you know, it'll gel up quickly with the temperature drop. So mm -hmm. in the summertime, you're going to see that's liquid. You can take that gelatin to 50 degrees if you need to, if you, if you yeah. need to get it to spread. If it's too thick to spread, warm it up more. I got some uh, rich sheets on the paper. when I tried to floating uh, over the paper. Yeah. Okay. How did it yeah. tell us how it turned out? How did it turn out? Uh, but not good. Not good. See, uh, oh well. See, not, uh, I mean, you have an image, though. Yes. Hey, yes, that's so. the beginning, guys. If you get an image from a process that you've never done before, that is some degree of success. Yeah. You can't, you're disappearing, Jan. Yes, I try here because this background here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a, there's a, that's a good start. 
that's a good start. I mean, you got to admit that's a, that's not a bad start. Just if your gelatin's too think, thick, though. I think she better know. Yeah, let's see. Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. But you see it here, down here, Richard. Yep. yep. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And your it's your negative your negative may be a little bit too thin. Is that redeveloped? Is that dense enough to print? Yes. 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 It's, I, I think uh, I overexpose a little too much because I see start fogging. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, get your gelatin to the point where, where it flows on the paper well, whether that's heating the gelatin up or heating your environment up a little more. Or if you absolutely need to thin that down with a little more distilled water, add a little more distilled water if you need to do uh, that. I think about trying a little bit more though, because I have all the bottles uh, I take later in the yeah. evening and I try more water. Oh. I take uh, maybe six uh, milliliter of water, hot water. Okay, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. And the, and the um, silver nitrate and the, um, so this, he's, what he's talking about, guys, if you have the book, we're on page 157 of my book, it's add four milliliters of the gelatin salt, four milliliters of the distilled or deionized water, and two mils of the um, silver nitrate. And so that solution poured or brushed onto a paper will give you the emulsion that you after it's dried to lay your negative on and print like the print he just showed us so keep keep us up to date Jan. that's great i'm glad you you tried that and the book will even give you better insight to it as you as you, uh, you get that it's, uh, very sharp and it's very glossy i like i like it because i took it, it on uh on this uh gallery print ilford oh nice gold, gold silk yes very nice you're going to love yes. it. You're going to love Once you get that emulsion down, you're going to love prints on that. Because that uh, gelatin chloride or ar gelatin aristotypes are a lot like collodio chloride or uh, collodion aristotypes. They're, uh, they're brilliant, shiny, glossy. And if you have, if you're after that look and feel, that's, that's, that's the way to go. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Jan. That's awesome. We love to see those kinds of things. Anybody have anything else? We can do uh, we can do a little Q and A if if anybody has anything. Um, I I don't know who's who's writing me something, but uh, so yeah. Um, switching gears back over to the oil prints, um, papers um, like I was mentioning earlier, and I just I just tried this. Um, um, hot press here, this watercolor paper, I just poured the gelatin. Um, I may, what I may do on this next video is give, show you an example of the Yepo, roll the Yepo out, roll the Hannah Mule out that we've already done, those two that you just saw in the video, and then I'll get another one prepared on the new Arches hot press paper and see, uh, see what kind of results we get there. Paper's a big deal, just uh, obviously we know this, paper's a big deal in this process how the, the look and feel, even though it's gelatin and ink, your, your substrate or your, you know, your, your, your carrier there is, it plays a big role. Your substrate pay, plays a big role in how it looks. So um, keep that in mind as we go through. And uh, I was even thinking about trying some of the, uh, I use the, uh, the Canson um, burrito paper uh, for collodion chloride. Um, and I was thinking about pouring some of that and trying. I, like I said, I'm experimenting right now to do a, a print series on this ghost dance work. I know I'm going to end up using the watercolor paper. I can almost assure you that because it just it just has the right look and feel. Either the Hannah Mule or the Arches, I'm I'm either one's very very nice to to work with. So, <clears throat> anybody have anything else tomorrow? Um, I'm going to do something completely different. Let me shut this down. Uh, not completely different. I shouldn't say completely different. But tomorrow, I'm going to have uh, um, uh, an hour, so to more or less an hour, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, 45, 60 minutes, depends on the questions and all that. I'm going to do a presentation, a portfolio presentation. And what I mean by that, I, I put a little piece up on uh, Facebook and, and my social media about it. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I, 
um, like this month I had three or four presentations. I, I do between one and five presentations a month. And presentations or lectures or whatever you want to call them, talks, uh, whatever word you want to use. And obviously they're all canceled, right? A couple at the uni, I had one in Nebraska. They're all canceled because of this coronavirus. So um, somebody was asking me um, about, uh, um, you know, you're not gonna do this presentation. Is there any way we could see what you, you'd normally present? And then John um, invited me to his photo club this next week. And all of a sudden all this stuff kind of came down. I was like, you know what? I should just do um, a, a portfolio presentation. I'll record it in Zoom and then I'll put it up on YouTube. And really what it is, is it's my work over the last almost 20 years in, these, in this process and four major projects that I've done over those years, a couple of decades. And what it is, it's about the work, but it's also about how I see um, what fine art photography is, how I distinguish between these, um, it's a lot about vernacular, the words we use describing things, like when people call something fine art, is it really fine art or is it commercial work? Is it commercial art? Is it, is it made with the intent to sell or, or make money on, which is fine. There's, this is nothing in the pejorative or not speaking bad about anything. Um, or is it made um, as a documentary image? Are you working in photojournalism? Are you um, working for a newspaper or a magazine, which I've, I've done a lot of? Um, you're interested in the story, but you're not really connected to it. Or is it fine art? Um, work that comes from you. Uh, and there's a plethora, there's a whole slew of reasons why you'd create the work. But this presentation addresses some of my reasons of why I've created the work. And I found over the years as I, I've given this presentation that I found artists, photographers, um, and not necessarily young people, but sometimes young people because I'm, it's usually I'm in an academic environment or you know, and there are younger people there. They'll say, hey, I've never thought about this. Or, or some of the older folks might come up and say, you know, that presentation you just gave really made me think about why I'm making the photographs that I make or why I make the work that I make. And it's not just photography. It can be in any medium, right? Um, and what I try to do with it is give people an idea of, you know, I'm, I'm a big Socratic, uh, Socratic uh, philosophy, like the Socratic method of examining yourself, right? Challenging yourself about uh, Socrates, about why you're doing what you're doing. Why do you make the work? And, 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 and there's no right answer. It, there, there just should be an answer for why you're making the work is all I'm saying. So if you come in and you say, I'm making uh, landscape photographs, um, and, and I challenge you and I say, well, why are you making the landscape photographs? Well, you know, they're beautiful. Okay, they're, they're beautiful. Um, um, are you selling them? Well, I try to sell them. So we call that fine art. We call it commercial art. What is it? If you don't really have a, a statement or something you can um, support that work with, I try to give examples in these presentations of people um, or, or myself making work, the reasons why I make that work, give the context and the intention of the work. Now, whether you like the work or not, doesn't really matter. What matters is that I have a reason for making the work and then I have some cohesive or, or coherent um, way of putting that work out there. So if you're interested in memory, identity, difference, and justice, and things that my work is involved in in marginalized communities and people um, that, have, that have been pushed to the margins, the groups of people, individuals, um, classes of people, um, and I ask questions around those things. If you're interested in that kind of thing, come and join me tomorrow for an hour. And you might, you'll definitely learn something about me because um, I won't be talking about chemistry that much. I do, I do have a little piece in there about, um, I show some differences in, in the technical and the aesthetic approach that I, why I've chosen what I've chosen. And the biggest question is why are we using wet plate? Why, why do you use the process? Why do you use wet clothing to make your work? Can you give a good answer for that? Can you give, not a good answer, can you give a defendable answer for that? Or do you just like to play? Do you just like, are you a kind of a tech geek and like to play around? Sometimes that's what I do. I just like to play around and experiment. Most of the time, it's to achieve a certain aesthetic or achieve a certain goal. Can this be done? What do I need to do to make this image look like this? So I've got, you know, 
um, in service of these big questions. Um, I don't have any answers with my work. I have a lot of questions. I ask a lot of questions about uh, the way we treat one another and why we treat each other that way and, and, and you know, why we're repelled and offended by some things and, and turn away on other things and why, why we've we kind of whitewashed and, and glossed over things in our, on our, in our histories that maybe we shouldn't have. Um, and so if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, the bodies of work range from starting in about 2000 all the way up to this last year with my ghost dance, my Indian, my Native American massacre site work. And I go through, I kind of step through each one of the um, projects and I talk about why I've done it. I don't read all the statements. I don't do all that. I just pick some highlights. Um, I kind of talk about what I've done in the process and, and, and how it's changed my life. And I'm in, I'm, I'm in debt to it, right? I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and, and I'm well aware of that. And, but if you're interested, tomorrow at 10 a.m., I'm gonna be right here for an hour. I've got a little keynote that I present up and I click, I go through. You can, you can learn about why I've done what I've done with the process. And maybe it might inspire you to um, sit down and, and think about and contemplate uh, things that, that you may be wondering about. Why am I making these photographs? What is it? What kind of verbiage or what kind of what kind of statement can I write? And I, I this is a real problem when I start talking about statements in art because people think, oh, artsy fartsy BS crap people. And there's a lot of them. I agree. There's there's I've read artist statements that are just so like, are you kidding me? They're crazy. Like the ephemeral issues, you know, they just, they use these big $25 words that nobody knows what they mean and they sound sexy and fancy. And, uh, <laughs> and at the end of the day, you come away from that saying, what in the hell did you just say? You didn't say anything. What are you talking about? So when I say statements, I mean authentic, really thought out, well-written, statements that support your work that don't supersede it that don't take you know that support your work that, that that shares in a paragraph or two of your ideas you know and and this thing people don't need to like your work they don't you know whether you like my work or not it really doesn't matter what i'm most concerned with are conveying ideas or concepts to people to think about i think art serves a huge function in allowing us to contemplate, th contemplate things that we normally wouldn't think about. And I think, that's a I think that's art's purpose, right? Photography's purpose, these big truths and social justice and politics and things like this. Um, you know, I think back, I think of this process itself, the wet collodion process played a huge role in ending the American Civil War. Those images coming back from Antietam and the bodies all bloated up on the battlefields and people seeing those for real. I mean, that, that those, you know, I'm, that's photojournalism, that's documentary work. We, we know that. That's not somebody expressing their thoughts and concerns and ideas about something. Maybe to some degree it is, but photography can play a huge role and does play a huge role um, in propaganda. And it's, it's all kind of propaganda. And propaganda used to be not such a, dirty word, but um, Edward Bernays wrote that book, Propaganda. If you've never read that, if you've never studied Edward Bernays, you should. Um, uh, oh, you're welcome, William. He said, William Gross says, thanks for joining my Zoom class. I got good feedback. Uh, Quinn. Please. Quinn. Yes. I think, I think about myself. I was a landscape photographer uh, in Norway. Big mountains, uh, beautiful landscape, and a uh, big ocean and everything. And I take thousands of pictures. Um, yeah. In the in the end, I only take I go out for a trip. I only go out and take five ten pictures, and all was very good. And two years ago, I start again. After thirty years, I start again with a lot of photo. I go more and in the perfect on composition, in the icons in the pictures. The golden ratio more perfect. Yeah. I take away things in the foregrounds, and suddenly I see wet plate. Also, I stop. I thinking so much about taking the photo that uh, the picture. I I take up my uh, digital camera again. I stop up. Oh, I must go two meters. 
one. I was down. And then I, I, I got much more keeper, uh, photos of keeping on digital after because of this process. Very good point, Jan. Yeah, slow photo, real slow photo. I love yeah. it. In, Engl in English, that's a very good point. In English, we say it made you more contemplative meaning that you thought more about making the photograph rather than just being kind of numb or turned off uh, and just kind of going out there mechanically. Wet plate will do that. It's kind of like um, even film, when you only have 36 exposures on a roll of film or 12 or 24, it has, it tends to say, you know, I always talk about working within limits and I think it's really important. I love the wet clothing process because I'm not going to do any sports action photography and I'm, probably not going to do much night photography and and those limits really constrain me into making images that I really have to think about. That's an excellent point, Jan. Thanks for sharing that. That's really good. That's that is. That's a very good point. We talk about that a lot. We talk about how contemplative the wet clothing process makes us making our chemistry, pouring the plate, sensitizing it. You know, you got several minutes before you can even expose a plate, right? let alone if it's going to it's going to be right it's going to be composed right you're going to develop it right you're going to fix it right you're going to varnish it right there's a long process from start to finish to have a successful image in this process and and i nothing wrong with digital i i don't people think i hate digital i don't hate digital i think it's just a different it's comparing apples and oranges when we talk about this digital is is great i love to document with it i love to snap you know images with it and that kind of thing but I think it's numbed us a little bit. It's, it's democratized photography to the point where even commercially people are, you know, losing wedding gigs because my, my cousin Joey got a, you know, a D 700 or a 5D or whatever. And now Joey can do them. Right. It, it's kind of cheapened the whole thing. And uh, it's kind of nice to have a process where you can't come in and you can't fake it. I mean, you can't fake collodion. What does Linda say? Yes, it's almost like time travel when you make wet plates. Yes, it is. And you know what, Lynn? I'm going to talk tomorrow in my presentation. One of my words is memory. And the memory um, of a people or persons or history, it is. It's like, it's like bringing, it's like taking an object or a scene or a person and it's like putting them back in time somehow, right? Because of the aesthetic. And, and we work for it. And I think, that's, I think that's valuable. It is. I love the aesthetic of it. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't use it if I didn't um, love it and didn't. Um, I love how I'm a primarily a portrait photographer. And I love how wet collodion translates the human being. Um, number one, when you make a photograph of someone, and this is a direct positive, I'm not talking about negatives, I'm talking about ambrotype or tintype. When you have that plate in the camera and you make that exposure of that person, it's, a re, it's laterally reversed, right? So we get to see them on the plate as they see themselves in the mirror. Right off the bat, we get a very intimate look. We've already changed the game. We're not flipping it around like our DSLRs and our, our, our regular cameras do, the mirrors, right? We're not doing that. We're taking that image as they see themselves in the mirror. And so we get a different look to them. Um, we get to see underneath their skin, the melanin, we, we, the UV, the, 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 what this process is sensitive to. It illuminates things, maybe freckles or maybe scars or, or some sun damage, something like this, that we don't get to see with our regular eyes. So it is a, it's a transformation of the human being. It's a translation of the human being. Um, in, in more real ways. I think, you know, people say, oh, it's so hard. You shouldn't photograph women in it and they make them look rough and this and that, you know, does it? I mean, I, I you know, people's concept of beauty is very different. Than, most people's concept of beauty is very different than mine. I find beauty in the mo what some people would think are gross or disgusting. I find beauty in, in things that people just aren't interested in looking at, at or, or photographing. I, there's a lot of things, beauty is a big word, and beauty to me doesn't necessarily mean the cultural standard of something that titillates you or turns you on, that kind of thing, right? So um, it, it depends on how we talk about these things. I'm not saying that I have any right ans answers. What I am saying is that I do understand why I've made photographs in this process 
for almost 20 years. And I try to give reasons. I try to give coherent, tangible, logical reasons, rational reasons of why I've chosen this process to work in. Yes, beauty in the ordinary. I totally agree, Peter. I think that's one of the things this process does is it just strips everything, all of our cultural and racial and ethical, ethnical and, and all of those things. It kind of strips it away and here we are. You know, like, I love that. I love that raw honesty, that raw beauty, that raw authenticity that, you know, there's no digital makeup. There's no fancy light tricks. There's none of that. And I know people are, people have brought that into the clothing process, but I, I love the straight natural North lit portrait in wet clothing. I, I don't think there's anything more beautiful. I really don't of any human being. I'd like to add something. Please, Tim. Good morning, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Hello. I think I'd like to give a word of encouragement to people who are just starting out printing. I don't, whether, no matter what it is, whether it's clothing chloride, salt, albumin, carbon, or oil. Um, what's the other one? Gelatin, gelatin chloride? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, okay. It, it's discouraging. And I, I, I love these forms because we really do need each other. Without each other, this whole thing is going to die, I think. <laughs> Um, there's all kinds of reasons why I say that, but I remember I, I've been carbon printing for maybe three years. And when I started carbon printing, I was so discouraged. I couldn't make a print. I couldn't get any highlights, anything. I don't know what I was doing wrong, but I was so discouraged. And I guess what I would say to people who are just starting out is um, don't get so discouraged that you quit reach out for help, ask people for help. There's not a lot of literature. Quinn's book is awesome. You're not gonna find a more comprehensive, detailed body of work in, wet, in the wet plate process and even the printing process than that book. Go try to find it. It's hard to find information. It's hard to get help. So don't get so discouraged that you quit. I, I remember three years ago when I was starting the carbon printing, I actually, I actually wrote you either email or I called you up, Quinn, and I said, that's it. I'm done with this whole damn thing. I'm giving up. I can't do this. It's pointless. It's useless. <laughs> and, you know, but I did, for whatever reason, I stuck with it. And it's been a three-year journey. And I'm still not there. I'm still learning. I learned something this past week that made a huge difference in my, difference in my prints. So... I would just encourage people to keep reaching out, keep studying, keep reading, keep asking questions, and don't give up because it, it can get very discouraging, wouldn't you say? That's, that's great, Tim. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think I can answer the question why you're, you're still at it. I, I really do honestly think I can answer that question for you. Why have you not given up? And I know you've had frustrations, and I've seen you go from this to this, to this, and you're just, you're climbing, you're just, every, every rung you go up, huge improvements. And it is, it's a process you have to learn. Any of these, it's a, they're processes you have to learn on your own. You really do. I mean, you, I, I totally agree with Tim. Reach out, talk to people, come into forums like these, come in and, and, and listen to people, what, they, what they're talking about and what they're saying and their results. But I think Tim, and, and I know Tim, uh, we spent time together. Uh, he doesn't live too far from me here in Colorado. And uh, I think I know why Tim hasn't given up. And I'm going to address this a lot tomorrow in my presentation. It's because he has purpose. He has intent to get this process right for a body of work that he's been working on for a long time. That's why there's there's a reason to go through that pain. There's a reason to keep trying, to keep spending money and failing and time and failure, failure, failure. And, and we live in a society that just does not embrace failure very well. We don't like to fail. We don't like, and if we'd like to see other people fail, the schadenfreude side of us, we take pleasure in seeing people fail. It's something wrong with us. Um, but we don't like to see, we see failure is exactly that, something bad and pejorative. And yet in these processes, failure is your greatest friend because when you fail and you keep at it, you're not gonna fail anymore. You start down here and the only way is up. So Tim has a reason 
to keep at those carbon prints. Tim has a reason to get the contrast he wants or to get a look and feel that he wants or a color that he wants. Though you have to have that. And I'm gonna address a lot of this tomorrow in my, my talk, my presentation, because without that map, without that guidance, does any, I always ask this question, does anyone ever get in their vehicle and just start driving just to drive? You usually have a destination or one or two maybe even. You have some kind of plan. And I'm not saying that's always the case every single time you, you load a plate or every time you make a print, but there's got to be some overarching purpose. There has to be some drive. Tim would have thrown this thing away years ago had he not had a purpose. And I've seen his plates, I've seen what he's working on. And it's a great thing to be working on. And it's a great end result for carbon prints for that body of work. It's a perfect match, it's beautiful. And, and it has re purpose and it has intent and it has context. And so those, those are the things I think people lose track of is that it's really easy to give up on site. It's really easy to stop driving if you don't have anywhere to go. If you don't need to go to the gas station or the grocery store or the, you know, the chemistry store, <laughs> um, it's a real easy thing to just say, I'm not gonna do it. Why should I do it? What's the reason? So I think that's why. Um, Phil says, this reminds me of a question with just wet plate. What's the longest exposure time you have done? Also, you feel the color spectrum that clothing sees open to the beauty. Yes, uh, Phil, the longest, my personal, and anybody can chime in here, but my personal longest exposure I've ever done is about 25 minutes. 25 minutes in the winter time, that's keeping my plate holder flat, wrapped in a wet, wet towel for humidity, trying to prevent the plate from drying out. Temperature, I'm gonna say uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, and a 22 minute exposure in a, with a pinhole lens on my camera, and it worked great. Oh, John's experimenting with the anthracite. Yes, anthracotype. Uh, anthracite coal is what I think of when I think of anthracite. Uh, anthraco Process has taken a week to get an image and it's terrible image. But there you go, you got something, that's awesome. You should share it with us, uh, John. Yeah, 25 minutes, yeah. Hey, John, get down here, buddy. Get up here. Oh, it's terrible. And Quinn, you know what? Uh, hey! It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. You talked about how how sensitive my gain is up on this on this camera. But it's yeah, interesting you, you talked about how sensitive this dichromate is. Because this is a 45 second exposure and it's still <laughs> overexposed. Wow. I'm nuking these things. I'm nuking these things 10 minutes. And finally, I found a, a reference uh, and, and to, to talk about Tim. Finally, I find this little hint somewhere in the early 20th century about giving this thing like 15 seconds to 60 seconds. Wow. And wow. that was 45 seconds and it is still overexposed. Well, tell, tell the people what you're doing. Just give us context on that, because a lot of folks uh, don't know. This is a, a 1879 Japanese process, and um, it's basically a, oh, I don't even know if I have my notes. Let me get my notes out real quick. Sure. But it's basically exactly like oil print, but it's a dusting on process as well. And, uh, and that is the asphaltum or, or gilsonite powder. That I that I dusted on that. Let me get into my notes real quick. That is really cool. I've heard of these things. I've never attempted them, but um, I don't think I'm not. I think in the uh, in the late 1990s, somebody you know, people in Japan were were using this, but I don't think anyone currently is is using this process. It's basically the same. Uh, it's basically double the amount of gelatin. Okay. Um, it's um. And then it is a 4% potassium dichromate solution in water only. Okay. And then it is a, it is a flow. It's not floated. You actually immerse this, this page, this paper in there for 10 minutes. Okay. And the interesting part is I really want to get a video on this Quinn, because this may be something interesting. Instead of using your magnetic borders, you're basically pulling up your, uh, you're pulling up your pages on the edges about a centimeter on each edge. Oh, I can bring that up. Yeah, and then a centimeter on this edge, and then when I bring them up while the paper's wet, I pinch the corners, and then I pour the the gelatin in the middle, and then I use the comb to to, to pull it out. 
Right, just like collodion chloride, how we pour the collodion chloride, right? We, but we, it takes it yeah. takes damn forever to uh, to dry. It takes damn forever for, of course, that dichromate to dry. Yeah. And then once that's done, like I said, it is a it is a forty. Uh, this this is I'm probably going to go to twenty second exposure. Um, yeah, but it just basically that. kisses. You basically see your uh, your 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 dichromate. This is also a positive process because unlike your your oil print you're taking a powder and the powder will adhere to the gelatin and not to the hardened dichromate. Gotcha. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. And then once you do that, you, uh, your, your initial soak is in like 85 degree water. Once you do that and you, you, you basically dust on this powder and then brush it in circles, you put it in an oven, uh, no more than about 140 degrees for as long as it takes the, the paper to dry. And wow. then you put it in a cold, cold, cold water bath, and then you can wipe it down similar to, um, uh, similar to gum oil. Wow. What a process. That sounds very cool. It's fun, but it's, it's still you, figuring it out. You, get, you definitely have to keep us posted on that one. Um, I got my hands full to get, get into any more processes, but you get, definitely got to keep us posted on that because that sounds like it's uh, not only promising, but it might have some really interesting results. Why would we ever look at all these different processes? And there's hundreds of them in the 19th century. These guys had so much time on their hands. They could just fool around and try this and try that and no holds barred there. So why would we be interested in fooling around and trying all these different processes? I, I, I say just, just on the surface, um, just to see if it can be done. And then secondly, you might get a bigger benefit and if it can be done and it's an aesthetic that you like or can employ or use in your work, that's awesome. I mean, usually, usually not all the time, you'll have the vision in your head of what you want something to look like, but not all the time. And sometimes, you know, influence is incessant. Sometimes you can see something and say, wow, that would work, you know, kind of a reversal fit. So it's, it's worth exploring these processes. That's why I really encourage, and it's great to do albumin and salt printing and all that, but I really encourage people to try the, the, uh, the aristotype processes, right? The collodion and the, the gelatin. Try the oil process. Try the pigment processes, the carbon like Tim's doing. Um, try these processes and see if, if you know that aesthetic is what you're after, it's probably worth the investment to uh, spend a little time and money to see if you can nail those down. <clears throat> yes, bringing something back from the dead, exactly, yes. There is, uh, I think uh, Linda talked earlier, it's like time traveling, like you go, you know, just the process itself, uh, visually you take it back. We're all time traveling. We're all working in the, this process that's dead for, you know, over a hundred years, right? I mean, when I say dead, it's not really gone away, but, but it's surely not mainstream, right? I mean. I saw the other day, they're now classifying uh, gelatin silver, traditional uh, uh, negatives and printing on silver paper is a, is a uh, uh, historic process. Or I don't call them alternative, what, they're not, I guess maybe alternative, I don't know. Uh, which chemical is that? What, what chemical, John? I'll just unmute, it's called a ferrotartaric acid. Oh. And I had a little bit of I had a little bit of luck with um, just taking tartaric acid and uh, and ferrous sulfate, and I was able to get this print. This print is supposed to be basically develop with your breath, and I was able to uh, to make something that was some that was able to um, to appear in steam, but um, I was able to get an uh, actually is it is it Herschel or is it Talbot? I can't remember. I can't remember if it's but Talbot actually has in his notes how to make this. Okay, and it's like weak. It's it's a little bit beyond my basic learning of, of chemistry that I've learned since doing this, but uh, yeah, it's it's a it's called ferro ferro tartaric acid. There you go. Yeah. Hey, start, start mixing stuff and just wear a face shield in case it blows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Th there's there's stuff there's stuff in these processes that you really do need to refer to the safety data sheet on some of them. And then you start combining them together, you can really have some uh, um, really uh, bad results. Um, not only off-gassing, explosion, um, eating through material, corrosiveness, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, 
uh, messing with chemi chemistry and chemicals, you, you should have your, uh, your, a little bit of your academic hat on definitely um, when you're doing that. I mostly stick with the, I love the pigment prints so much because everything is so inert. The most it's gonna do is get your ink, uh, ink on your hands and the dichromates obviously are dangerous, but you can you wash those away. So um, what do people call their film and alt process work? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great question. How about that question John's asking? And, and Dale says, uh, historic, <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm, I'm 35 years old, my skin of my teeth. I don't, my, my teeth don't have skin, but you got it. Real photography, yeah. What do people call their film and alt process? My, I don't call anything alternative processes. I, I've never believed in that. I call, histori them, I call them historic processes. If they're from the past, they're historic. Alternative would imply, and I understand people are saying this, digital is mainstream, so anything not digital would be alternative. I get, you know, but, you know, one day I say I'm not a stickler on words and the next day I say I am, but that's what I, that's how I say it. I say um, historic and um, contemporary and digital would be the mainstream use too. Yeah, did, and I've seen people produce great digital negatives for these uh, historic printing out processes. Um, I've never felt that they're as good um, in hand. Um, they're, they're very comparable online, but I've never felt they're as good in hand. There's, there's just something that a wet collodion negative gives you that, that's really hard to beat. Real photographer, yeah. Uh, just so, just, let me add to this little conversation here. If everybody looks in the chat, you can see what people are talking about. But um, in the 19th century, you were not called a photographer unless you made negatives and prints. You were called an ambrotypist or a tintypist or something else. You were not called a photographer. So the only people that got to wear that or hold that title would be the guys making negatives and make mostly albumin prints, right? Um, but any prints, making negatives really were the thing. So photographers making were called, people making negatives were called photographers and people working in the positive processes were called ambrotypists or tintypists or ferrotypists, depending on what part of the world you were in. Or daguerreotypists, right? Um, Talbotypists. <laughs> All these typists we have, right? All these kind of different processes. But it's good. Why, why, are we, why do we get so hung up on the words? Um, when you walk into a gallery of photographs and you, you walk up and you don't know the artist or artist and you want to look at the images, you want to understand, because it's important to have context and the intention behind that, you want to understand what kind of image am I looking at is it a photographic print? Is it a pigment print? Is it a, you know, what, what is it? You know, we want to know what the material is, how it was made. And then we want to know about the intention, the context and the intention around the image. Why was it made? Why did this artist make this image or this body of work? And what that, what that gives us is a, is a better understanding of, of looking at the work and understanding it like you don't walk into a movie, a two hour movie, you don't walk into it an hour into the movie, right? You don't open a 400 page book up to page 200 and start reading. You just don't, don't do those things. You need context. So understanding what the materials are, is this a daguerreotype? Is this a ambrotype on black glass? Is this a, an albumin print made from a wet clothing negative or a digital negative? All those things matter uh, for context. Um, so in the, in the essence of, of information and context, that is important. When I walk in, my feelings are this. When I walk into a gallery, and I haven't done so in a while now, but when I walk into a gallery and look at a photo show, and there's no statement, and there's no, um, there's no artist statement, and there's, there's nothing telling me what I'm looking at, I just kind of get this sinking feeling and say, hey, I, I can walk up to any image and bring my own feelings to it, right? And project my own filter, look through at it through my own filters. But I refuse to do people's intellectual work. That work needs to be done by the creator of that image, not by me as a viewer. That's not my position. I'm going to anyway. I'm going to watch, oh, wow, that looks like where we, 
we went to Twin Lakes when we were kids and there's the lake and oh, you know, I mean, I'm, maybe I'll have some of those thoughts, but the, the, the intellectual work needs to be done by the creator of that work. And that's, that's kind of how I feel. I, I agree, Quinn. And I think that if you look at the oil print you did this past week of uh, some trees, yeah. right? Okay. Um, if you look at that, you think, oh, okay, some trees. Yep. <laughs> but but when, you, when the artist tells you, and there's no way for you to know this unless the artist tells you, that yep. that's where some human beings were massacred, right there at that site. Yep. You know, then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, yep. it just brings so much more feeling and emotion and understanding to it. And it's like, hey, I'd like to have that image, you know, that's yeah. a cool image. <laughs> but unless you said that, as the artist, we don't know. It's just a set of trees. That's Big right. Deal, right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Very good point. And I use that. I use that often. I that's a great, great example of that. I use that often talking about um, changing people's perspective of looking at this kind of inane, or maybe the process is interesting, or maybe the color is interesting, or it's just kind of a ah. There's you know we don't read that right off the bat kind of thing visually. And then you put the context to that image and all of a sudden that image changes. Um, and, and as the artist working that, that example Tim just gave uh, of the keep out or the no trespassing, you'll see that the next video, we're gonna do the no trespassing. Those massacre sites where human beings were slaughtered um, and to be there as the artist, to be there in those places and to make those images, it, 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 number one, it was challenging, but number two, um, you I never look at those things the same again. It, it changes everything about this mundane uh, scene, which is not mundane at all. This is a piece of history. This is a part of, you know, think about, you know, what can you do with a piece of land? That land, and I've, I've said this before, I've taken material from those that land, and I photographed a lot of the material. And Tim knows this in the past, I photographed um, dead sun, uh, sunflowers, dead sunflowers, three of them tipped over. I've taken that sunflower material and turned it into carbon six, right? A coal, charcoal. And I put that charcoal in carbon tissue and made images with that land, pieces of that land in that image, right? And without knowing that, not understanding that process and not understanding um, uh, what the artist is doing and what you're trying to communicate. What you're trying to do is you're trying to compete with every other blade of grass out there making photographs and you're trying to bring an audience in and tell them a story or ask them a question. Are you concerned about this? Does this resonate with you? And, and good ways to do that are through process and through you know your, your work methodology. How are you making these images? And to bring pieces of land into the image like that and then to show those images to people of just three dead sunflowers or a mountain range or whatever, or land or trees, um, engages them on a different level. Now you've got material in that image that was part of that land where blood flowed, people decomposed. All these trees and these, this vegetation is all part of that now. So you, you start engaging people on a different level that way. And that's very, very true. DAS sensitizers instead of dichromate. Um, a DAS sensitizer. I, what is that? Um, I don't know what DAS sensitizer is, Jan. You'd have to explain that. I'm not sure. I, don't, I haven't. I've only used Um uh, Mr. Topshit, uh, Peter Lin. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, Mr. Topshit, he uh, used uh, something called uh, DOS sensitizer instead uh, of uh, decomite because in europe and uh, in norway it's very difficult to get this stuff uh, after we have some uh, terror in the uh, past uh, 2011 with explosion in uh, oh. oslo city yes, yes. so yep. uh, i just watched that the now. government is that very now. very sensitive to what you can buy and have in your house <laughs> gotcha yes so uh, mr top shit uh, petalin uh, he talked about dust synthesizer, and it's. Uh, he also used that in uh, carbon print, I think. Okay. Talk about par co yes, carbon print also. Are you I see a few video. Okay. Maybe uh, 
maybe Tim can talk, uh, talk about it. Is it is it I, ball diazo photosensitizer you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, I've never used that, Jan. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, I don't either. We 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 have we have uh, dichromates readily available. Um, uh, oh, it is. Yeah, it is diazo. Yeah, yeah. That's what, what is that, Quinn? Uh, it's a lot more expensive. I know that, and it's it's safer. Um, it's it's uh, what they're concerned with is a chromium base that we're we're talking about. And and Jan, I just watched that documentary on Oslo. That that was oh my god, that was unbelievable. Um, a guy blew up the the government building downtown, and then went around. He went to an island and shot a bunch of students and all kinds of crazy. Yeah, stuff. eighty students dead. Yeah, it just, it was terrible. I just, I couldn't believe that. Crazy, but. but um, but what they're worried about is like the ammonium nitrate, the fertilizer we have here. Um, what, what, what's happened on the American side is we've got, you can't get, um, you can't get, uh, you know, they, they monitor a lot of these things. I'm on the Homeland Security watch list for even the stuff I get, not the dichromates. The dichromates aren't the problem, but um, I, that diazo speedball, that's what, I, that's what I've heard people, I have heard people using that. I would imagine it's the same thing as a DAS. I'm not sure. I know it's not harmful. I like like dichromates. I know that. Oh, it hardens the layer. You squeegee on silk screen and then sensitize. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Try it. Try it, uh, Jan. Let us know. I'm 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 sure it works. I mean, why wouldn't it? I just there's so many alternatives. I just I haven't been out there enough to to try those. I find stuff that works and. Uh, I let other people come in and, and tell me about it because I got my hands full. <laughs> so, but I have plenty of, uh, I've actually, my rundown is this. I know nobody's asked me this, but I'm going to tell you this. My absolute favorite thing to do in these processes are make wet collodion negatives and, and three of the printing out processes that I to completely, absolutely love are oil prints, collodion chloride, and gelatin chloride. Those are the three printing out processes I love the most. And out of those three, the most um, I've done is the collodion chloride and the, the collodion aristotype. And uh, it's just, uh, it's for, and, and tomorrow I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you some examples of the pot print versus the oil print. Um, I, I do love carbon. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a straight factor there for me. As I get a little older, I'm a little more poetic. I like a little more pictorialist look and feel. Um, remember, we talked about those waves in, in photography. We had that response to straight photography in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, and all the pictorialists came out. And then in response to the pictorialists, we had the F64 group and, you know, Steichen and Adams and all those people come back with straight photography. And now digital photography is kind of taken over. And there's a lot of people, and there's always been some people, but there's a lot of people turning to the more pictorialist and actually even transcending photography and getting away from photography and doing prints and, and, and non-silver non printing and stuff like that. So in cost, there, there's, there's all kinds of different ways that you can produce images, right? Intaglio, um, uh, the Woodbury types, the... Uh, the uh, photogravures, um, those kinds of things. And uh, those are all non-silver uh, processes. A lot of them look like silver gelatin, but it's mostly due to color and quality and aesthetics and archivability. If you're working in the pigment prints, um, one of the things that really turns me on is that archivability. Not only the visual matching the, the image with the content and the story, but that archivability really says something, um, something I don't know that we need to worry about archivability now, do we? <laughs> no, I don't want to be a bummer. I don't want to be a bummer. We won't go there. But uh, but yeah, so you find your process. Play with them. Play with your project. Maybe it's not wet collodion you shoot your stuff in. Make your plates, in, make, make your images in. Maybe it is digital. Maybe it's film. What kind of format do you use? Um, what kind of uh, variant do you use in a particular process? Um, all those questions I think should be answered. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with playing with all of these processes. People always 
uh, not always, but people have gotten on me in the past saying, why are you discouraging people to do this or do that? And I'm never discouraging people to do anything. I'm, what I'm saying is that you can get locked up into this gear acquisition syndrome where all you talk, what kind of lens is that? You have a four by five reducer back or you can get caught up into the, what kind of collodion did you use? You know, you can really get caught up into the chemistry and the gear. And, and I find a lot of times people that don't have much to say with their work kind of tend to lean to those things because there, there, are, there, there are communities and groups, huge ones, much larger than these groups that, that get involved and support that. And, and there's nothing wrong. Maybe you need that particular type of lens or gear to do this type of work or that particular type of film or chemistry to do this work. But it never really lends, leads that way. It le uh, leads to more of just experimenting and really kind of, of imitating, you know, the Ansel Adams and the, the uh, Edward Westons and the, and, and there's nothing wrong, you know, influence is incessant and emulating a person's style to get somewhere to grow, that's great. But at some, at some point in time, you need to get off the milk and get to the meat. You need to get what's inside of you and your head and get that out, out on paper or glass or yuppo or something. <laughs> you need to get it out, right? And that's, I'll, I'll talk a lot about this stuff tomorrow. I, I, I go through the whole thing. It's a little more organized. My thoughts are a little more organized. I have a little presentation I do. So that's what I'm doing tomorrow. I hope you guys can come in and join me because you might have some questions at the end of it that I'd love to answer. Uh, you'll learn a lot about me, learn a lot about why I've done what I've done in the last 20 years. And uh, you might find it interesting. Um, uh, you might not, and that's okay too. But um, at least you can come in and decide for yourself if this is a path look worth looking down for your own work or potentially starting your own work or in your own work now and you don't, you're not able to break over a barrier or break into something that, um, that, that, you know, that you feel comfortable about sharing. Because at the end of the day, if we show images, my theory is, is if we present photographs or prints to public, the public in a gallery online, in person, whatever, um, you should be able to defend why you made those photographs in a logical, rational, reasonable way. Doesn't have to be right, quote unquote. No, or the people don't have to agree with the concept or your positions or whatever. But at least you need to be able to defend that work. And and I'll talk about that. I'll do, I'll talk tomorrow about how in the past how I've had to defend my work and what some of the the um, positions people have taken with me on what I do with my work and uh, and my position and my connection to that work. So. I'm going to let you guys go. It was so great to see everyone. Um, I hope you can join me tomorrow because uh, I think we'll have a really good discussion um, about making photographs, making art, why we do it. Um, hey, Doug, good to see you, buddy. I haven't seen you for a while. That's, that's another friend of mine there, Doug Darling. I know him personally as well, too. Um, so it's, it's, it's great. Uh, Dale, so I'm glad you joined us. And William, uh, Michelle, uh, everybody, man, that's great to see you guys. Um, I, I just, I've been rambling myself, so I might be hung over tomorrow. <laughs> well, if you're, even, if you're, even if you're hung over, join us. I'll, I'll, I'll make the headache worse for you tomorrow. So thanks, everyone. You're wonderful. Thank you for spending your time. Part three, next time, next Wednesday. We'll, we'll ink these babies out and we'll see what we got for photographs. Thank you. Have a great day and stay safe. All my best.